All right, another uh, short video, and then we'll do our little worksheet after a five-minute break. Uh, the topic of today, or this uh, second mini thing, is on inference. So we sort of mentioned last time you can chain, uh, using the law of thought, you can chain together um, certain laws of thought, and you can deduce something to be true or not. So we're going to talk a little bit more today formally about inferences and the, uh, the allowed kinds of rules of arguments you can make. So first off, what is uh, an argument? You really, when you perform a deduction, you start with some basic premises, right? So you, every argument basically takes the form of this. P1 and, let's say, PK, you have some body of knowledge, and you want to produce some conclusion. So this is called the body of knowledge. It's your set of premises, and you deduce a conclusion Q. Um, so even the ancient Greeks figured this out. It's like, if you know nothing, then you may deduce nothing. So you may start with some basic set of premises. And these are called your premises, your body of knowledge. And this is your conclusion, what you're trying to deduce. Um, now, uh, here's, an, here's another quick thing. It's, uh, we don't really care if the premises themselves are true or not. We care if the pre we an argument is formed assuming the premises are true. So you may even argue about something that isn't true. You may deduce an argument about something that doesn't actually happen. If P is if one of the uh, pieces of information you have, one of the pieces of evidence, is not true, right? A lot of times, people on the internet argue like about how illogical certain people are or something like this, like flat earthers or something, right? But, but flat earthers don't think that they're acting illogically because they're like, well, my argument seems sound. And this is true for many different groups of people. And the, the really the reason what's going on here is that um, they're not deducing the conclusion incorrectly. They're still applying correct rules of deduction, but they're beginning with a premise which is false, right? An argument is valid is valid if uh, P1 and PK, so this, this again is a shorthand for an and, you assume all your premises to be true, they're all true, you assume all of them, uh, and you deduce the conclusion, an argument is valid if this is a tautology, if this implication is a tautology, right? Tautopy. Tot all. Uh, what is a tautology again? You guys remember what tautology is? One of those cool words, spell words you got to remember. The tautology is it's true for all all values, right? The truth table column is true, 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 right? Um, what happens now? Suppose you're a flat earther and you assume uh, an incorrect piece of evidence to be true. Suppose some pi. Uh, Is, is false. What can you say about that? My statement is false. Or that if that statement would be false. Then. Well, you have an and of several things. If one of them is false, what do you know about the and of several things with one false thing? It's all false. It's all false. <laughs> what do you know about false implies anything? False. True. True. Oh, true. True. It's true. So, if you assume an incorrect premise, you can still have a correct argument. So they're like, well, my logic is correct. You know, I did my P's and P's Q's correctly. They, they're not going to say that, but they're, they don't see the error. doesn't come from the deduction. The deductions may still be performed correctly. The argument is still valid. But, it, the whole, if, and if you assume something false to be true, then you can prove anything, right? That's sort of ridiculous that the, the argument is still valid if you assume a false to be true, right? So um, that's sort of a quick application of this. So uh, the way we want to perform a deduction is going to be like uh, this. We start with our premises, P1 to PK, uh, and then we draw a line, and then we do dot, 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 and then we do Q. So what we do is we, 
this is the, the syntax we use for uh, uh, a rule of inference. We have a, a set of assumptions, uh, and we deduce Q. So this is, again, our body of knowledge, and then this is Q is our conclusion. This is the notation that we use for this, right? Um, has, you guys seen this symbol, the three dots, before? I don't think you have. This one part may be new. Three dots means therefore. So this lecture basically is going to be me giving you all the rules of inference, and then we'll do one example of how to apply them. One or two examples, right? And we'll do, of course, another example of what you in a second. But, uh, so what are valid uh, rules of thought? Let's do an easy one. P, P implies Q. Therefore, what? Q. This is probably the most famous rule of inference ever. In some sense, everything is simply this rule of inference. It has a name. Does anyone know the name of this? I expect no one to know this one. It's called modus ponens. So you are going to successively apply these rules of inference to your argument and get the conclusion out that you want. Once you do that, you've successfully deduced what you want, right? Suppose you're given P, and you're given that P implies Q. You may therefore, via inference, deduce Q, right? Let's say um, if you get into a car crash, then you die, okay? You got into a car crash, therefore you died, right? Another way I can think of P implies Q is that uh, actions have consequences. Actions have consequences. Action was performed, therefore consequences. That's another way to think about modus ponens. This is a really famous one. What we can do to prove, you can prove everything again is done in the background, the white noise via truth tables. But we sort of want to elevate ourselves past that and just implicitly manipulate these truth tables without having to actually do them. You know, when you do five plus two, again, you don't write one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one, of course, right? You just kind of, you jump there. So what we can do is really quickly, we'll just show that, um, it's a tautology. True, true, false, uh, false, true, false, false. Uh, P implies Q. What's the truth table for it? Quick. True, false, true, true. True, false, true, true. You should remember that one. That one's that one's a quick one. Uh, now we want this to be uh, true. So what we're going to do is uh, do P and P implies Q first, right? What is P and P implies Q here? What you do is you go to the row P, and you go to the row P implies Q, and then you simply and them together. What is this truth table row going to be? True, false, true, true. True. False, false, false. False, false. False, false, correct. Right? Now we want to do the final one, which is P and P implies Q, uh, therefore Q, right? Just double check. Okay. What is the truth table for this one? Take this column and do this column implies this column. True, 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 true. 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 False implies true, correct. False implies false, correct. Look at that, that's a tautology. So P and P implies Q, therefore Q is a tautology. Therefore, this is a valid form of argument, so we may use most opponents. Right? I'm not going to do the truth table for each rule of uh, inference simply because it's tedious, but you can perhaps believe that they're all true, right? Instead, we'll sort of High level explain in English why they're correct. Any questions on modus ponens specifically or, or, or arguments or inference or anything like this? Yes? Can you go over the, the, last, um, the last one? The truth table calculation or the truth table calculation? So we want this implies this, right? So we're going to look to this one and do this one implies this one. Is it true or false? Does true imply true? True. Does false imply false? True. Does false imply true? 
Yes. Does false imply false? True. Yeah. Think of when you do this, it's always just like a reordering of the one truth table you know. Like, these two are always going to be in standard form. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. That one should always be the same. This one is always going to be true, false, true, true. But when you do an implies of anything, uh, it's going to be just like a reordering of the columns of it, right? So it's the same thing. If you're not good at truth tables, don't worry. It's, I mean, like, I don't trust anyone who's good at assembly. So to speak, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, you have to, it's, it's the, it's the, you need to know it to know how to do the other things, right? More questions on that? Yeah. Could you also uh, simplify, like, the, the, the Boolean expression or the expression? I would bet that if you were to apply the laws of thought to this one, using the laws of thought that we gave you, you could reduce this all the way back down to a tautology. But, usefully, this is the form that we care about. Right. If we just only had one rule of inference, which is truth exists, that doesn't really help us. Right? Um, here's one. Not Q. P implies Q. Therefore, what happens? Assume not Q. Assume P implies Q. Therefore, what? This one, I think, is a challenging one. Not everyone thinks this way. This is a non-obvious rule of deduction. I've only seen this useful in, like, Sudoku or something, where you're like, well, this, this square must have a 3 in it. Be through a kind of a complicated argument. What, may you, what would you think you should deduce from not Q and P implies Q? Not P. That's correct. This is called modus tollens. P implies Q is actions have consequences. Right? Uh, consequences... Consequences didn't occur. So action must not have occurred. You agree with it that way? Um, if you get into a car crash, then you will die. You're not dead, so you must not have gotten to a car crash yet. Right. Modus tollens is, I think, a really powerful one. Uh, these are all like little spells that are teaching you. This one I think is not obvious to anyone, but when you when you remember it, it's actually surprisingly useful. This one comes in really often. And again, you would prove this through either a truth table or using the laws of thought to get a tautology back out. But it is certainly true. Um, questions on modus tollens? Why is it called that? Latin, I don't know. More questions? Okay. Um, P implies Q. Uh, Q implies R. Therefore, what? He implies R. He implies R. Think of this like a path in a graph. P to Q, Q to R, therefore P to R. That's all this is. This is called hypothetical, I can't even pronounce this, hypothetical syllogism, 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 syllogism. Um, this also says, if you think about the implication as a relation, what do you know, do you, are you guys familiar with what this is, says for the relation? This is a transitive relation. Right? You can chain events together, right? Um, if you make an A on the exam, then you will pass the class. If you pass the class, you will graduate on time. So, if you make an A on the exam, then you will graduate on time, right? Actions have consequences. Those consequences may be actions for more consequences and so on, right? Things change. P implies Q implies, and you can chain this 10 statements, 11 statements, a million statements down, right? P implies P1, P2, P2 implies P3, and so on, right? All right. Um, here's an easy one. 
uh, P and Q, not T, therefore, you don't have to think about truth tables or anything, just think about the way you, you argue with people, with your parents, right? What, 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 what must be true? Q. Yeah. If P or Q is true, and P is not tr true, then Q must be true, right? Um, Alice or Bob is bringing cake. Uh, Bob says he didn't bring cake. So Alice brought cake. Alice must have brought cake. This is a valid deduction. This is a valid argument, even if Alice actually didn't bring cake. Because you assume your premises are all true. Now, if they're wrong, then you argue with them. But you assume P or Q to be true. And you assume uh, Bob did not bring cake. Therefore, you may deduce, you may infer, uh, that Alice had to bring, bring cake, right? Do we agree? It's also kind of trivially true by the way or works. It's really the way to think it. This one is called uh, disjunctive syllogism. God, this room has more than one mic. All right. You're not going to believe this. P, therefore, Ah, wrong. P or Q. This is called addition. Why you would need this, it's not obvious. But if P is true, certainly P or Q is true. You agree? Uh, P and Q, uh, therefore, what? Uh, simpler than that. P. This is called simplification. So what you could say is something like, uh, I like cats or dogs. And then a detective puts you on the stand and says, so you like dogs, huh? You know, let's simplify. Let's focus on the fact that you like dogs. I don't care about the cats. Right? Simplification. Um, P, Q, therefore. P and Q. This is called conjunction. That one's easy. Um, P or Q, not P or R. Therefore, this one's a challenge. This is actually called resolution. But therefore what? Uh, Q, what if Q is false? Would P, if Q is true, if P is true, Q, Q could be false. So it's not necessarily uh, just Q. R. Well, for the same reason, there's a symmetry there. It can't be R if P was false. P could be false and R could be false. Q or R. Hmm? Q or R. Q or R. If, think about P and not P as two cases. If P is true, uh, then R must be true. If P is false, then Q must be true. So P is either true or false, 
So either Q or R is true. One of Q or R must be true, right? You could do this by adding together this, and maybe as an exercise, P or Q and not P or R. Perform distribution, rearrange terms. You're going to have a P and P or all these things. You're just going to simplify that down. You're going to get uh, Q or R, right? You apply the, apply the uh, laws. OK? Um, those are the, all the laws that we have. Um, let's do a quick uh, example of what applying the laws of inference to deduce a conclusion is. Suppose we have the following uh, set of premises. We have not P or not Q uh, implies R and S. We also have uh, R implies T, and we also know that not T. Now, this is actually taken from a word problem of a body of evidence uh, given, and it's been translated already into, into propositional formulas for us. And we want to, to deduce an event occurred. We want to deduce uh, that P occurred. So the way you would write this is uh, you present your uh, argument in a two-column proof. Uh, you, proof is a much more general, much more rhetorical, much more beautiful skill. But as we're learning it, we have to build up to that. And we have to sort of equip several sets of training wheels before we slowly cast them off. But uh, I guarantee you that we will cast them off through the course. When you write a two-column proof, what you do is you begin with a law, and then you explain where it comes from. So I'm going to begin with uh, either a rule of inference or a premise. And you explain what rule of inference it is. Uh, R implies T is line one. This is true because it is a premise. Okay. You want your argument to be valid, so you go step by step. Then we know uh, negation of T. Right? This is also true because it is a premise. From there, we may deduce what? Not R. I'm going to go really slowly so I make sure I uh, don't mess up. Let's call this lines 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. Um, not R is true. You would say... What's the name of the, of the spell? Modus Tollens <coughs> of 1 and 2. So you would also say what lines in the proof that you do. Again, training wheels mode. We're gonna cast, we'll cast these off later. But negation of R is true because if you take the modus Tollens of lines 1 and line 2, you will get negation of R. Agree? Now I'm going to bring in um, uh, negation of R or negation of S. Uh, why is that true? Every line of the argument references prior parts of the argument. Pretend you're a lawyer in front of a judge and you're explaining yourself. Your argument must follow causality. Everything that comes after must follow from something previous. Why is R not R or not S true? Simple reason, actually. The Morgan's law in line one. Uh, maybe, but it's, there's another reason that I'm thinking of. Addition. If not R is true, then not R or not S is true. Right. Um, what about... Um, this, you said De Morgan's Law, right? What is that? Let's, we, have a, we have not something or not something. What is it? What, we apply De Morgan's. What do you write that as? R and S. Not R and S, correct. That's De Morgan's of line four. Um, then we have a premise. So not P or not Q implies R and S. What can you do from line five and six? Modus tollens. Um, 
What would it be? It would be not, not, not P or Q. Not Q. Now, we, obviously, you're about to simplify that. Yes? You wrote the modus tollens on line 6. You're right, sorry. This is a premise, and this is modus tollens. All right. Two quick remarks. First, if you're having trouble like guessing what the next step is, that's actually expected. When you do a proof, you do it three times. First, you kind of figure out the scratch work. Then you figure out sort of the high-level structure a second time. And the third one, you rewrite perfectly, and you turn that in. Now, when I'm doing it on the board, I'm not showing my thought process behind the deduction. The work is not being displayed. The answer is only what I'm writing down right now. So if you're like, you're not knowing where the next line is, that's fine, because I know what the answer is, because I already worked through the problem. You haven't necessarily done that yet. So if you're like, well, I don't know what's coming next, because you don't know what my full argument it is. You know? So don't worry about that. I'm just showing you what a correct answer is supposed to look like. Right? Second thing is, notice that I could have simplified this immediately, but I won't. Because that, um, that requires a second rule of a law of thought, right? So I can't do that until I cite it in this training wheels form. I would have to cite the law before I could apply it. Um, but let's go ahead and simplify that. If I were to simplify that, what law would I use? De Morgan's. De Morgan's. And what would it be? P and Q. It in, let's just say it would be. Uh, in the most formal sense, we know it's P and Q. But if we were to apply it literally, it would actually be something else. Not, not P and not, not Q. Yes. That would be De Morgan's of 7. Right. Now, we may simplify it to be P and Q. P and, well, that would be, a, it depends on who's grading this, actually. Could you say in one line a double application of the same rule, which is P and Q? I'm going to even say, let's suppose not, and do an even simpler application. That would be P and not not Q. Do you agree? Yes. That would be double negation. Of uh, eight. Um, what do we know about P and not not Q? Simplification, which is just P. That's what we wanted. The conclusion we wanted was just P. So we have performed a valid argument using either the laws of thought or the rules of inference to deduce a correct. Uh, we have performed a correct argument. Notice an argument is correct if each of individual steps are correct. If you ever make a single mistake, a mistake, a mistake during the argument, the whole argument, unfortunately, is a, a fallacy. You know. If you make an, this is true for both, you know, like human arguments. You try, an argument is a very, like, real human thing. It's the way we communicate and assert truth to each other, right? So if you make a, an improper jump or you make a mistake during the proof, the whole argument, unfortunately, is incorrect. The only time an argument is correct is all of its sequences are correct. Only then may you uh, confer that you uh, correctly inferred something, you know? So given these three premises, we may deduce, we may correctly infer that P is true, right? We only have a relationship among the other uh, things, but we may deduce that. Sometimes, given, the, uh, given this, a body of knowledge, you may not be able to deduce something. The body of knowledge may even be contradictory, and then you know that your premises are wrong, right? Suppose you only had P implies Q as one premise. You don't know if P is true or not. That doesn't tell you enough, right? Any questions on this argument? All right, let's do uh, some laws of thought, uh, some rules of inference using uh, quantifi quantification.
Um, for all x, uh, p of x, from this you may deduce uh, p of c for some c. This is specialization. It's called uh, universal instantiation. Universal instantiation, basically, if something is true for all x, whatever the universe of discourse x ranges over, then it's true for one of them, right? So again, you, this is like a specification. You know, if something, everyone, let's say every Georgia Tech student has a GTID, then Bob has a GTID. That's a valid form of argument. Do you agree? If everyone, if he's a Georgia Tech student, because every Georgia Tech student has a GTID, he has a GTID, Bob has a GTID, right? Um, Here's, uh, if P of C is true uh, for any C, uh, you may deduce what? That's true. But actually, this one's a little too obvious for all x, p of x. This is called universal generalization. Now, you, it may not be obvious when this rule is app applicable. Generalization. It may not be obvious when this rule is applicable because it's like, well, that sounds obvious. But it, it may actually depend on the universe of discourses and things like this as you get more complicated examples. If you have a statement and you can assert it's true, perhaps through a sequence of ands that is true for every element in this domain, this universe of discourse, then for all x, p of x, where x is then ranging over whatever that universe of discourse is. Right? This is also kind of an, an obvious one. Let's do one more obvious one. There exists um, x, p of x. Therefore, what? I'll say it, p of c for some c. Right. This is called existential instantiation. Right. If you know a statement uh, for all x, p of x, then you know there is a c such that p of c. Yes? Why is it all one for some? This is called inst universal instantiation. If it's true for all x, it's true. Kind of, you can say, for all x, p of x implies exis exists x, p of x. Think of it, you could think of it that way. If every Georgia Tech student, for all x in, this, in the universe of discourse of Georgia Tech students, p of x is true, every Georgia Tech student has a GTID, <coughs> then you have a GTID for some c. That's some c being used specifically. c is an instant, right? Um, these are almost too obvious when they, when they may apply. But again, imagine. Imagine a lawyer constructing an argument in front of a judge. If every student has a GTID, Bob, specifically him, has a GTID, right? And then there's one final one, which is uh, symmetrically mirroring all these. Uh, if P of C is true uh, for some specific C, therefore, what? Yeah, I'll use x instead of c because c let's, is an instantiation, let's say, just syntactically. For example, uh, 2 is even, uh, therefore, there exists an even number. That seems like you're kind of going backwards from a conclusion, but it's certainly true. If 2 is even, then there exists an even number, right? That's sort of the way that you would apply this argument. And this one is called existential generalization. Awesome. All right. Um, let's uh, take a five-minute break.